Welcome to Calvary's Chancel. For worship today, may you be blessed by your participation and challenged by God's Word. The hymn that gets us started is All Creatures Worship God Most High. with you. We sing our hymn of praise. Forgive our sins as we forgive. death, the brothers of Joseph begged for forgiveness for the crime that they had done against him. You intended to do harm, Jacob said, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. First reading comes from Genesis chapter 50. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him, and then his brothers also wept and fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. I am in the place of God. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intend to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join in the responsive reading of Psalm 103. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You will not always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. You have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor repaid us according to our iniquities. 
For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love for those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you, O Lord. This Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here, Paul helps us to understand that despite different practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge or discount one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for all of us and will judge each of us. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on to those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. <clears throat> those who observe the day, observe it in the honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in the honor of the Lord, since um, they gave <clears throat> thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to the Lord. So then, give each of us, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> comes to us from St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then this fellow fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed 
and they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. The mercy of our Lord sets you free so you can take your turn in passing it along. Amen. Americans love to keep score, and not just for sporting events. Since it's an election year, we are hearing way too much about the scorekeeping of polls and all about winners and losers. We even tend to consider our salary in terms of a scorecard. So when it rises, it becomes a higher score, an indication of one's significance. We insist on playing a numbers game in many areas of our lives, even for church attendance. We unconsciously seem to keep track of who did what, and if that's a score for or against their account. We want to make sure we don't end up owing any debt of gratitude, for we expect to keep ahead on the score sheet. In the Gospel, Peter is concerned with what is required when a fellow member sins against him, asking how many times does he need to forgive, or at what score can he stop keeping track, and at what point is a disqualifying score reached? It's necessary to imagine that it's easy to imagine that he had a specific person and incident in mind. So does he need to keep track as many as seven times? Peter wants to know how long must he forgive before he can cut them off altogether. In Genesis, we have recorded a lengthy account of the life of Joseph and where forgiveness was provided and where not. As a young man, he had dreams of glory that he could not help but brag about to his brothers. He saw himself in a position of lording it over them and he made sure that they knew his power score would top theirs many times over. That did not set well with the ten older brothers, so they arranged for him to be shipped off, shipped off to Egypt into slavery. To their father, they explained that Joseph had surely been killed by a wild animal for his coat of many colors was soaked in blood. That little subterfuge was prepared by them to cover their misdeed. For years, they figured that had settled matters in their favor. Joseph was well out of their lives. But when extreme famine brings them back together, the brothers realized just how dreadfully they had treated Joseph, and surely he would extract vengeance to even the score. They could see that his long-ago dreams had actually come into being. They were indeed bowing down before Joseph, and they were wholly dependent upon his benevolence and will. Now, Joseph had experienced many ups and downs in his life's journey, from that pit into which his brothers had tossed him to being a steward with major control in a rich man's household, and then back to the depths in prison, and finally transported to the palace. 
all part of a few dreams come true. Each side trip of his life was brought about by jealousy and envy. His actions had gotten misconstrued and twisted so that he lost his reputation of good standing. His scorecard kept getting dropped to zero, yet he pulled himself together and relied on his trust in God to make use of whichever circumstance he found himself in and moved forward. He found forgiveness to be the means for enabling him to release the past and start looking ahead. When he finally meets with his brothers again, he does remember how they hurt him by what they had done, and he's tempted to retaliate, yet he does not dwell on that. Instead, he finds the means to reunite the family so that he is able to care for them all. Naturally, it was difficult for his brothers to trust how Joseph would respond. And while they worry and fret, Joseph weeps for all that was lost. Joseph chose not to be resentful or to give a payback. He looks over the course of his life's journey. He remembers it all. And he sees how God has put those pieces together in a new way. Yes, they sold him into slavery and felt vindicated in harming him. But God used it to bring life to his people. God intended it for good. It was God who took him from the pit to the prison to the palace. God was in control throughout. So Joseph comforts them and reassures them that they need have no fear of him. Joseph has no plans to balance any scales. Jesus, we see, sharing a parable that explains God's attitude regarding scorekeeping and forgiveness. This story puts human sin into the context of our relation to God. It provides the big panoramic picture. It was meant to show Peter the contrast between seven times of forgiving and what the 77 times have in mind. A servant owes the king an enormous debt. Since we are not familiar with the appropriate exchange of talents to dollars, it may not sound so huge, but this amount would exceed the national debt of a small country. It was way more than any person could ever repay in several lifetimes, even if they won some lotteries. This incalculable amount is being compared to our indebtedness to God. It just cannot be balanced. A second servant also owes money. He owes it to that first servant. It's a decent amount, but a measurable one. And it would be possible for it to be repaid with time and patience. As you no doubt noted, the servant who was forgiven refused to give the one who owes him that time to pay. We are not told why he refused. We are given no rationale for his lack of compassion and mercy, even though it follows directly on the heels of the largesse he has just experienced. But being the humans we are, and knowing those various humans we have encountered, perhaps we are not so very surprised. Once upon a time, there was a small community that decided to put on a passion play about Holy Week. In their search for a person to play the part of Jesus, they found a young man who really looked the part. But he was not a Christian. He was not too familiar with Jesus' story. Nevertheless, he accepted the part and rehearsals began. As the young man carried the cross to Golgotha, 
The crowd began to jeer, calling him names and spitting on him. The actor became incensed. It was too much. He laid down the cross that he'd been dragging and tore into the crowd with his fists flying. The director and the others had to pull him off. And then they tried to explain that Jesus was patient, kind, and forgiving, even during this time of his passion. The young man was given time to cool down and reconsider his role. So the rehearsal resumed. As the jeers and the gestures began a second time, the actor paused. He looked out at the crowd and said, that's okay for now, but just you wait until after the resurrection. Rather like Peter, this young man assumed that there was a limit to what even Jesus would be willing to forgive. Once the score went over that magic seven, then watch out. Recall that it turns out it is Peter, the one who thought in terms of scorekeeping, who actually has recorded in scripture the many times he strikes out. Certainly Peter had been a faithful disciple. He was a leader of the twelve, the first to follow and call. He was the first to name Jesus Messiah. He walked on the water very briefly, but he was always a risk taker. Yet Peter is also the one who denies Jesus three times and was nowhere near as Jesus hung on the cross. But if Peter knew about himself what we know, he would realize that seven times was not nearly enough to be assured of one's forgiveness. Are we any more clear-sighted than Peter about our need? Do we acknowledge the ways that we bring harm to others in our relationships or through the unjust systems that we perpetuate? How can we become as aware of our capacity to sin as we are of the aptitude of others to sin against us. We learn of the fate of that unforgiving servant when the king gives him up to be tortured until his impossible debt gets paid. We are being reminded how difficult it can be to forgive, what a torturous process it involves. We may need the assistance of a trained counselor or a spiritual director to find the healing that is needed in order for us to take that final step of forgiving. We need to learn to rely on God's immeasurable mercy to find the way to show us how to be truly tolerant and generous in providing a pardon ourselves. We can be thankful for we are offered a strengthening in this process of forgiving. It comes in the supper. As Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In the bread and in the wine, we receive the absolution we need so that we can pass along the mercy that others need from us. Amen.
Let us join together in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join in praying to our Lord. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Christian education classes and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth, especially as we seek to do your work in new ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and provide safe shelter for all those who have lost homes to fire and flood. We ask your blessings upon Kelly Keel and Edward Brown, who will be united in marriage this coming Saturday. Grant them many years of companionship and joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not condemn. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make us a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness for the knees that have taught us to pray, and the tongues that taught us to praise you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, and whatever else you see we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Amen. We take time to give thought to how we share the bounty the Lord has bestowed upon us. We give thanks for the good that you can do with all that you have received in maintaining this congregation, in spreading God's word, and in caring for creation. Be generous in ways that build one another up. And we come before the Lord. Holy God, our bread of life, our table, and our food, you created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your Son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, 
saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want. And by this bread and cup, make of us the body of your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your church both now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we pray, our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy I will be done, on, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. to God. The most important announcement this week is for you to remember to come to Holy Communion as a drive-through event on the south side of the church building on Monday, September 14th at 1.30 till 2 o'clock. Tuesday, if you are here to watch the DVD, you can receive communion then, or Wednesday on the 16th at 10.30 in the morning till 11. And then keep in mind uh, that Calvary has our annual congregational meeting on September 20th. It will be here at the church at 11 o'clock or also on Zoom, and you will have instructions for that next week. A good day.